It's true that a man could not be criminally prosecuted for raping his wife in the 19th century English-speaking world. But it was not true that marital rape was accepted or that its harms were ignored. I'm Janice Fiamingo, and this is the Fiamingo File 2.0. One of the most popular and seemingly decisive pieces of feminist evidence for an oppressive patriarchal past is the claim that rape within marriage was legal until the second half of the 20th century. It must have been the case, so the thinking goes, that wives were viewed as property and husbands given carte blanche to do whatever they liked with them. The real story is far more complicated. Yes, marital rape didn't exist legally because man and woman were considered one person in marriage. 18th century British author Sir William Blackstone, who published an influential book on English law in 1765 called Commentaries on the Laws of England, had declared that by marriage, the husband and wife are legally one person. Sir Matthew Hale, author of The History of the Pleas of the Crown, published in 1736, had insisted that a husband couldn't be criminally convicted of raping his wife for, quote, by their mutual matrimonial consent and contract, the wife hath given herself in this kind unto her husband, which she cannot retract, end quote. In other words, in marriage, the wife was understood to give consent to sexual relations, a consent she couldn't legally withdraw for as long as she was living under her husband's roof. The husband, too, had contractual obligations. His obligation was to maintain his wife financially, including being responsible for all her debts, even if that landed him in prison. Feminist critics have emphasized only the burden on the wife, not that of the husband. The wife's burden to offer sexual comfort to her husband and to bear his children was considered different but equal to the husband's burden, which was to endow his wife with all his worldly goods, even if she left him. And as will be explored in future videos, British barrister Ernest Belford Bax, in his 1906 book, The Legal Subjection of Men, emphasized how throughout the 19th century, the obligations of the wife to her husband were consistently lightened under British and American law, while the obligations of the husband to the wife remained in place. In refusing to criminalize marital rape, English law made clear its understanding of domestic life as the most private realm where the state shouldn't interfere unless absolutely necessary. Sexual relations in particular were held to be a sacrosanct matter that husband and wife must work out for themselves. It was well known that abuse could occur within a marriage, but it was thought that over-meddling by the state was a worse abuse. It is not, however, true that marital rape was therefore considered acceptable or that there were no remedies for it, social or legal. In practice, family members frequently intervened in cases where it became known that a man was abusing his wife. Often fathers or other male relatives stepped in to take a woman away from a bad situation. Legal scholar Constance Backhouse, in her History of Women and the Law in 19th Century Canada, tells of the early 19th century marital troubles of George and Esther Ham, which led Esther's father to rescue his daughter from the man he condemned as a damned rascal. You have ill-used my daughter, the father was reported to have said when he arrived at his daughter's house. I was able to support her before she married you, and I am so yet, end quote. Moreover, at least some legal commentators were quite willing to recognize the legal harm of marital rape, even if they didn't call it rape. Legal scholar George Burbage, author of Criminal Law, published in 1890, contended with Hale's assertion of male impunity. 
commenting on Hale's insistence that a married woman couldn't retract her consent. He said, quote, it may be doubted whether the consent is not confined to the decent and proper use of marital rights. And he went on to specify that, quote, if a man used violence to his wife under circumstances in which decency or her own health or safety required or justified her in refusing her consent, I think he might be convicted at least of an indecent assault, end quote. And in general society, the moral harm of marital rape was widely acknowledged, not only by feminists who found many public forums for their denunciations of male brutality and who lobbied for marital rape to be criminalized, but also in non-feminist popular advice books and manuals on marriage which articulated general 19th century attitudes. These advice books made clear that a man should never force his wife. According to a lengthy analysis by University of Minnesota law professor Jill Elaine Hasday, from whom much of the following information is drawn, Marriage manuals in 19th century America repeatedly instructed husbands to refrain from sexual intercourse if they didn't have their wives' explicit consent or even invitation. Their arguments focused on the potential harms to a woman's health of becoming pregnant and also insisted on the woman's moral right to bodily autonomy. In his book, What a Young Husband Ought to Know, Sylvanus Stahl wrote that as a, quote, free moral agent, a woman was fully able and well within her rights to regulate sexual relations in marriage, and he urged husbands to exercise manly self-restraint in deference to their wives' sexual authority. Medical doctor William McClowry advised men to, quote, await the wife's invitation to sex. John Cowan, in his book, The Science of a New Life, argued that it should always be the wife's right to direct sexual relations. He stated categorically that she was owed, quote, the right to her own person, the right to deny all approaches save and only when she desired maternity, end quote. Elizabeth Duffy, author of an advice book for women called What Women Should Know, stressed, quote, the extreme cruelty of any husband who forced maternity onto an unwilling wife. Many such advice books agreed that, quote, the conjugal embrace should never be indulged in against the wife's wishes. The husband may have the power, but he is a brute if he imposes upon his wife the pain of labor and the perils of maternity against her consent, end quote. Feminist critics objected that these injunctions were merely appeals to male good nature without the force of law behind them, but it seems evident that a significant portion of both men and women of the time honored such moral guidelines. Feminist leader Elizabeth Cady Stanton exhorted women at temperance meetings to withhold sex from alcoholic husbands as a means of moral suasion. Her advice was, quote, live with him as a friend, watch over and pray for him as a mother would for an erring son, but be not his wife, end quote. Stanton clearly thought it was well within a woman's power to prohibit sexuality in marriage, and there's no evidence that the women in attendance at her meetings found the advice ridiculous. As legal scholar Jill Hasday admits in her compendious analysis of writings on marital rape, this supposedly unspeakable subject about which women had allegedly no power was quite commonly discussed with significant recognition of women's agency. And there were also legal remedies for marital rape, though they didn't go so far as feminists of the time would have liked. As the 19th century progressed, American divorce law increasingly recognized sexual cruelty as a ground for a wife's petition for divorce. Remember that during this period, divorce was available only for cause, the recognized grounds for the wife being a husband's adultery, desertion, or cruelty. A man found guilty of divorce grounds was both socially shamed, 
and legally obligated to pay for his ex-wife's maintenance. In the first half of the 19th century, American courts were mainly silent on the question of whether marital rape could be made a ground for cruelty. In one case, in 1845, Emmeline Shaw sued for divorce with the claim that her husband had forced her sexually even after she had told him that her health couldn't bear it. The Supreme Court sympathized with Mrs. Shaw but didn't grant the divorce, expressing itself unwilling to interfere without clearer grounds for the cruelty allegation. In a few years, however, the Shaw decision came under criticism, with Joel Bishop, the author of a leading family law treatise, alleging that Daniel Shaw had behaved improperly toward his wife and asking, quote, how a wife could ever protect herself from the devouring consequences of ungoverned lust warring against her under the cover of marital right, end quote. His first published criticism of the Shaw decision was in 1852, and by 1873 he was convinced that, quote, the majority of American judges would differ from the conclusion arrived at by the Supreme Court earlier in the Shaw case. In the last quarter of the 19th century, divorce began to be liberalized generally, and the claim of sexual cruelty was recognized by an increasing number of courts and the language used by judges in delivering their rulings was explicitly and harshly condemnatory of the husband's, quote, brutal gratification of their lustful passions, end quote. Interestingly, law professor Jill Hasday also reports that in the last third of the 19th century, a number of husbands sued for divorce on the ground of their wife refusing marital intercourse. A majority of courts that heard these petitions denied them. Thus, it seems clear that by the latter part of the 19th century, a wife could divorce her husband for non-consensual sex, but a husband could not divorce his wife for denying sex. In other words, a man unlucky enough to marry a woman who refused him intimacy, which was by no means uncommon, had no socially acceptable options. It's not clear whether husbands ever complained about wives' sexual voraciousness, and the widespread belief that the average husband would force sex on an unwilling wife is insultingly common among both feminist and non-feminist commentators. Though social and legal records provide little more than glimpses into the everyday behavior of 19th century men and women, we can at least conclude, as does Hasday in her study, that concern for women and, quote, criticism of marital rape were neither unthinkable nor unspeakable in this era. Feminists didn't win their goal of criminalizing rape within marriage. That would have to wait for close to a century. But the image of the insensitive and predatory husband and the modest and long-suffering wife were already staples of feminist and non-feminist discussion. <laughs>